we're going to be a gorgeous small and intimate group tonight because we think that a lot of people will be watching the recording so hello to everybody here and also to those that are watching on the recording later welcome to animate earth um we have tonight with us somebody that i've been wanting to talk to for a very long time uh we've almost met a couple of times trevi johnson who is coming in from new york and i'm sure many of you will know her as the author of radical joy for hard times which for me has been a really seminal work on the relationship that we have with places, which is something that we have been really interested here in Animate Earth for a while. She's also written a new book called Fierce Consciousness. The subtitle is, I'll read it because my memory is terrible, Surviving the Sorrows of Earth and Self. So we're hoping, Trevi, that you'll talk a little bit about that tonight. But before we go into that, I would just like to take a moment to welcome everybody, to welcome you all, to welcome the ancestors of your places and all the creatures therein, creatures that are seen and unseen in places of beauty and wounded places, places where you belong or places that you are visiting. But we welcome all in tonight from around the world and we ask to be witnessed in the work that we do here in service of places everywhere. So welcome everyone. Trevi, lovely to have you with us. Just to explain why we're interested in your work particularly, um, as I've just said, we are interested in developing relationships with places. But of course, as with relationships with humans, you open your by doing that, you're opening yourself up to um, grief if those relationships are lost or wounded in some way. And I wondered if you might just speak a little bit about that to begin with, about the grief that comes up when places you love are wounded and what it is that you recommend people do in that kind of situation, just so that, yeah, it, in answer to this kind of concern that we have about really falling in love, about belonging with the places that we find ourselves, so kind of in at the deep end, are you able to say anything about that? Yeah, well, yes, yeah, so we do love places. You know, we, we love places where we grow up. We love places that we move to because we fall in love with them. Sometimes we fall in love with places that we've never been and we go there and we instantly fall in love with them and don't want to leave and want to come back. And, uh, and when something happens to those places, there is, there is grief. And for a long time, we have been told that it was inappropriate to feel grief for a place, you know, at least in the Western world, certainly, you know, in, in, the, in the white Western world, we have been told that. And scientists, of course, have made a, a, a big, strong effort to be sure that when they want to protect a place or, or a species, they are very, very careful to not be emotional about it. They don't want to be. They don't want to be accused of anthropomorphizing, of, of giving human feelings to this place. And yet, the, I think that it's it's time we acknowledge that the places that we love are meaningful to us. And uh, and I've read accounts as far back in the in my Radical Joy for Hard Times book. I have a bit of a poem by Horace, the 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 Roman. Um, I don't can't remember what his dates were, but it was hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And he was bemoaning the loss of the beautiful fields for villas to be built on Rome's hills. You know, so we've had this sense of of love and loss for place for a long, long time. And and I think by not expressing it, we hold something deep inside of ourselves that that is that is only exacerbated. It's a wound that's exacerbated in us because we can't acknowledge the wound in a place. So the analogy that I often make is it's like 
when uh, somebody that you love is is ill and you go to hospital or you go to their bedside at home in order to be with them, you don't ignore them. You don't say, oh, well, my friend can't do what she used to do. And therefore, I don't she's not my friend anymore. You know, you go and you visit and you talk about what life is like. You talk about what your life is like, what your friend's life is like. Perhaps you bring a gift. You bring beauty. You know, you bring beauty to a, what is often a very sad situation. You don't deny it, hopefully, um, but you certainly don't ignore this beloved person. And so why would we ignore beloved places? So I created Radical Joy for Hard Times, the organ, my organization, and wrote the book uh, to invite people to pay attention to places that they love that have been hurt and to go to them and to make beauty there. That's what I love about your work in that it's really hopeful, it, it, you know, in, in the way that beauty can be used to kind of um, help the situation. I mean, I think probably a lot of us are now in places that are being wounded or, or places that we have to live have already been wounded before we get there or we're separated from those places we love. But I'm particularly fascinated by this idea of, OK, well, we can use that as a force for change. You know, beauty kind of um, can make this better. So, yeah, could you could you talk a little bit about beauty and what you mean by that? Yeah, it's such a wonderful concept. Um, it's it's a kind we can recognize beauty. We can describe something that's beautiful. The, the tendency for a lot of people, perhaps even most people, is if you see something or hear something beautiful, you want to point it out to somebody else, uh, assuming that they're going to find it beautiful as well. But you can't, it's really hard to describe beauty itself. Um, but with, with, the, with the events that we do with Radical Joy for Hard Times, it's very, very simple process. It's about going to a hurt place. Going there is important, not just meditating at Anafar. Um, sharing stories about what it means to the, everybody who's there, finding beauty, and you know, the, and 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 what we've discovered over and over and again is that you can't find beauty until you actually acknowledge the reality of what's there. You know, you not the beauty doesn't come right away. You can't hurry it. You can't push it. You have to look at the wounded woundedness first. And then uh, a very important part of it is to go and spend time on the place and get to know it as it is now, because it's never exactly what we think it is. We might think we know what it's going to consist of, what it's going to look like, how bad we're going to feel, but then we're surprised when we go there. And then the final step is to make beauty for the place. And we do that just by using materials that the place itself offers, like sticks or stones, uh, earth, sand, soil, whatever it is. And so what's so extraordinary about this process? And I don't pretend to understand it, but through the process of attending to a place in that particular way, and especially that act of giving something back to it, uh, pe people's relationship with these places profoundly changes in that short time. You know, most of these events don't, you know, they might take an hour, an hour and a half. Some, I've done them that have been much shorter and with a lot of people. But it's almost as if the reality of the situation of that place and the reality of our own situation and our emotional connection with it, even if we've never been there before, something really alive happens. And, um, you know, it is it it is animate earth. It's, it's, it's a... Uh, it's an aliveness that comes forth and there's a sense of reciprocity that happens. So it, it's a pretty extraordinary process for something so simple. I was going to use the word reciprocity actually in, in, in my kind of next question. So you, I, uh, that, so that's what we kind of work and practice towards this idea of reciprocity with place so by kind of opening yourself to you know the, the kind of more than the place just as a physical space you can have kind of a living conversation with it that's really fascinating that that is what you're finding uh fairly fairly quickly it sounds like it, 
does that happen in all places or are there particular times when that happens or particular yeah people or it always happens it always happens it's just remarkable and it's very frequent that people will say something like well i didn't really want to do this thing like i didn't really want to go to this place an old you know a dump or whatever and but my friend wanted to and i care about my friends so i went and then i ended up falling in love with it and um I think it's it's a little bit about how we see how the natural world is so determined to thrive, to push up through what's wounded. Um, I mean, an example that I often think of is I led a week long vigil in a clear cut forest years ago in British Columbia on, on Vancouver Island. And we would go off in the day and we would sit in areas of the clear cut. I mean, there were thousands of acres that were cut. We would sit in these places and just pay attention and do ceremony and ask questions and talk to the trees and the birds. And, and as I was sitting on an enormous stump one day in the place where I was going each day and a mother bear and two little cubs came just trotting along over this. The, the, the debris from the cut trees was about two feet high. It was really difficult to even walk from it was difficult to walk 10 feet because there was so much debris and you could fall through. And these bears were just dancing along. And to them, you know, it was just all that slash was just a way of getting from one place to another. So you see these remarkable things. You look in the, you look inside of a, a an enormous tree trunk down in the bottom and uh, there's rainwater in there. And there are all of these little bugs that have made it their habitat. Uh, so you see things like this, and then it's also it's as it's as if the the place is slowly revealing itself to you because, and I think this is important too. We go to these places not to fix them. You know that's the tendency if you love the earth. You go to some place that's not what you wish it was, and you want to fix it. What can I do? What can I can I pick things up? Can I bring in a bulldozer? Can I redivert the street? You know whatever. And um, and by just being there and listening, this remarkable exchange happens. It's if the place comes forth to meet us and we go forth to meet the place and our ordinary human consciousness fades a little bit and we're in a we're in a we're in a sacred space with a with a place. I'm really fascinated about how you do it because um, it feels as though it's the same that we that we all do. I'm sure we all do, you know, when, whenever I'm sure we've all experienced this. But you talked about ceremony. Do you do you consciously bring in ceremony then? How, how does that work? Well, we don't tend to call it that, but I think of it as that. I think of those five steps as a ceremony. Um, to me, they're a ceremony because you're entering into a place with a particular intention, um, which is to learn, which is to have a dialogue, which is to to face something that's that you have thought in advance is probably going to be unpleasant. And maybe you don't want to go and face it. Um, but you decided that you're going to because you care about this place. And and why run away from something you care about, you know, like that friend? Um, and then it, it concludes with this gift, this gift giving. Um, and so for me, it really is a ceremony. I mean, I, we tend to not call it that with the, with the organization because... If, you, if people don't want to think of it as a ceremony, they can do it anyway, and it still is, it's still effective. Do you find that different places have different responses or doesn't, is that not how it kind of emerges? Um, it's interesting. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Because it's such a it, it's such a um, it's such a subtle thing to ask. Like so we we did a book that came out last year called "You've Made the Earth More Beautiful," which was stories from the first ten years of the Global Earth Exchange, which is our annual event. And um, and they were they were all kinds of places all over the world. 
um, from scientists doing something for their glaciers. I mean, just all, all kinds of different places. Um, but I think the, the one thing that really does always happen is this, is this sense of becoming a little, a little less out of our human world and, and into it simply being with the, the, the greater consciousness of the earth. And, uh, and and sharing something. I mean, just for an example, I was in Portugal uh, years ago, and um, they were. It was, it was a very. It's very dry land where this uh, center was, and uh, they're they're really trying to make it green and and lush and fertile, so animals and birds will come and be there. And they have, to a large extent, succeeded. And there were about forty of us who went and did one of these radical joy events at a place where they had dug the place for a lake, but the lake wasn't filled yet. And we didn't have much time and people went off to, to explore. And they, they, and usually we like to have say 30 minutes or so for people to get to know the place as it is now. But it was very short. And yet people came back with all these amazing stories of only, and only being there 10 minutes. They just came back with stories about how the designs were in the cracked mud at the bottom of the lake and uh, somebody saw a frog and the frog jumped into the water and somebody was looking at the colors. It's just, it's just extraordinary. There's, I think there's, there's something in us human beings, even if we think we can't do it, that this, it's like this window shade flies open and we are in a world that is very, very easy to be in, which is that I'm not separate. I'm not just a, an automaton moving through the world and the world parts at my footsteps, that there is a connection, there are vibrations, there's a frequency, whatever it is, but, um, but we can be touched, we can listen. Yeah, we had a, um, a talk a couple of weeks ago uh, from somebody a medicine person from the Romani gypsy line in the British Isles and his tradition talks about the common wild tongue which I love as a um idea that the whole of the rest of the world speaks a common language that it's humans that have trapped themselves out of because of our kind of language that we've developed for ourselves and I really love what you're talking about because it's okay how do we re-access that common wild tongue which I think is the same yeah, thing you're talking about here it's a that, I love that term too. And I love this, this, this exercise. Even before I created Radical Joy for Hard Times or wrote the book, I've been leading these uh, various kinds of wilderness trips and weekend workshops and all. And I would always have an exercise and invite people to go out on a walk and, and, and pay attention to what was calling to them and then sit there with it and speak to it and listen. And you could see, I mean, every single time you could see people trudging off with this look of kind of resentment and doubt in their eyes, like, well, that's not going to work for me. And then they would come back and I'd say, who has a story? And sometimes people would say, I don't have a story. And I would say, you have a story because you, you're a human being with your whole life, your, your, your fears, your desires, what it was like to grow up in your family, what happened to you today that's affecting your mood, and the place is constantly changing from instant to instant. So something happened. And it would invariably be that everybody who came back to that circle would have a story. And they were, they were always amazing, beautiful stories. And, um, and, and, and I always would say too, like, don't doubt the story. If you felt like the if you felt like the leaf of the tree told you something, don't say I probably made that up. Just you know, say the leaf of the tree told me something. Yeah. It's valid. Yeah, have trust in whatever comes up. Yeah, I like that. Do you find that that that, that happens more in wounded places than in naturally beautiful places? Or I don't. I think it's just the consciousness we bring. I think if we bring an openness to um to the aliveness of where we're going perhaps in a in a wounded place the aliveness is more of a surprise you know you, you go to a wounded place and you think you're you're let me a lot of people don't want to do it at first because they think i'm going to be so depressed that i you know, i won't even recover 
and it just doesn't happen. It's kind of like the reverse the reverse happens. There's sadness, but then you spend a little time there, you make that gift, and something different happens. So um who who is coming? Who is doing so you have a global earth exchange the day after tomorrow, which is people all around the world that are making these beautiful acts in, in wounded places. What are the many people? How how is it going really? Yeah, we had well, we had people uh, sign up because we have gifts, we have these little flags. Oh, here's here's a little flag this year. This is the Global Earth Exchange. It was actually made by a group of 11 year olds in London, led by a, a woman who's an artist um, named Sarah Pimenta. And um, they made all these flags. So um, everybody who signed up got, got a flag. Um, I think there are at least about 70 who have signed up, perhaps more. Uh, there's always more who come and do it who haven't signed up. And uh, oh, there's a huge variety of places this year there's one in Estonia um, for uh, ancestral land there's going to be one in uh, Helsinki Finland um, Spain um, France England um, Northern Ireland I believe and in many different states in the U.S. and they range from all kinds of places uh, a river that's polluted uh, a river that has a lot of waste in it um, there's somebody in Germany who did one already for a field of strawberries where they put a lot of pesticides on the fields and, and then they cover them up with plastic, which is then just a waste. Um, all kind, I mean, there's just all kinds of things and, and, um, and they, they vary so much. So that you, it might be a great big farm it might be a tree in somebody's backyard. A good friend of mine here in Ithaca, New York, is going to planning on going and uh, doing something for ash trees because there's an insect um, called the emerald ash borer, which is killing all the ash trees in the, ash trees in the United States. And um, I'm doing one for the bird, the bobolinks. The bobolinks are these wonderful little bouncy birds that live with white fuzzy heads, and um, and they're endangered because so much pesticides and, and herbicides have been put on farmlands and um, that makes them sick. So they don't, you know, they don't breed very well anymore. So that's what, that's what mine will be. Mm. Can you say a little bit about how you started this? Yeah, we, well, we founded Radical Joy for Hard Times in 2009 and, uh, and we wanted some way to launch it. And so in 2010, we created this event and called it the Global Earth Exchange and invited people to find and make beauty in hurt places. And uh, it was such a wonderful event. Well, so many people on that particular one, I think we had people in all seven continents participating. And it was it was so it was so energizing and invigorating and moving and inspiring. And we just said, well, this has to happen every year. Mm -hmm. So this will be the 14th year of it. Wow, that's amazing. And and how about you personally? How where, how did you kind of come to realize that making beauty in wounded places kind of can help both parties? Well, it's actually I I um I used to live in New York City for years in the 70s and 80s, and I used to write multimedia shows for all kinds of organizations and institutions. And um, I did one about David Paulus, who was from the Oneida Nation, Native American. And uh, he described having won a National Science Foundation grant to recycle steel waste. And he told me that he'd had a realization that the steel waste was not, a, was not an enemy to be conquered, but an orphan which had gotten separated from the circle of life. And his job, he said, it was to bring that orphan back into the circle of life. And this was 1987. It was a long time ago. And I was just really, really moved by that idea that recycling was more than just a physical act, that it was a that it was a, an emotional act. It was an act of the heart. It was an act of the spirit. And um, and I I tried for years to think of how to somehow uh bring this into the world in a way that didn't copy him. I mean, he's he's a native person, he's indigenous, 
Um, and then I, so finally it just came to me to create a nonprofit because I because I did do that. I did do a program in that clear cut. But for the most part, people didn't want to pay money to go to hurt places. You know, they wanted to go to they wanted to go to beautiful places. They wanted to go to green mountains and oceans and things. They didn't want to go to clear cuts. So um, but with but but by creating a nonprofit out of it, a charity, uh, we were able to make it personal to all of the people who are involved in it, um, whether they're deeply involved in it or very, very uh, superficially involved in it or peripherally involved. Um, it's for everybody. It's for everybody because we all know what wounded places are like. Mm -hmm. So ca can you say a little bit about kind of regular practice then in wounded places, how that can kind of benefit? I mean, I'm sure we all know many wounded places. What kind of regular practice? So you've got the Global Earth Exchange Day in two days time for kind of big events what about having this as something more regular it, it would be it's a wonderful practice um it's it's i think it's simply a very very easy matter of keeping our eyes and our ears open for places that are hurt and could use a little attention and then when we come to these places to make some beauty for them to acknowledge it and make beauty and it doesn't have to be a big act you know, so for example, um, I had an email from a woman who was walking on a trail that she really liked in her home, near her home. And a lot of the trees had been cut down because somebody bought some of the land and they were going to build a house there. And she walked on feeling sorry for the trees. And then she decided to go back. And so what the, the, the act of beauty that we recommend um, you know, it's kind of, it's a symbol. It's, it's, a, it's not necessary to make it, but it's, it's most people do is a bird because birds, there are birds everywhere. Birds are symbols of transcendence. Birds sing through wars and dark nights. Um, so she came back and she made a little bird um, on a stump. And in that simple action, what happens is Oh, I acknowledge this is a wounded place. I acknowledge that I feel sad about it. I don't have to walk on. I can turn back. I can allow my heart to open for what's happened. I can perhaps, and I think this happened for her, she can even see that the people who were building the house had left a lot of trees because they obviously did like trees. They just had to cut some down. So there was a kind of a new relationship that happened with these people she didn't even know. And then she made a gift for the, she made a gift. So a lot of stuff happened in, oh, it was probably didn't even take 15 minutes, I would guess. So with that, that's the kind of practice. Um, you, we can't always stop. Maybe we're driving by and we see an animal in the road. But whenever I see an animal that's been hit by a car, I always just sort of nod to it and, and wish it well. You know, I, I, I wish that you'll, ha you'll, you'll have, you'll return to life and be healthy. Just, just, just acknowledging it. Um, I think that just opens us up. That it makes that kind of noticing and that kind of practice part of our daily life and consciousness. And that just has to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna open up if anybody would like to ask Chubby a question. I'm sure you all, all know this, but on the reactions, if you just raise a hand uh, just to get some other voices in as well, you're totally welcome. Um, what are the most beautiful kind of things that you've seen, Chubby? You must have seen hundreds and hundreds of acts of beauty in these places. What, what is there anything particularly memorable? I just think they're all beautiful, honestly. Yeah. I mean, if you look, we're in the process of putting all the all the stories of all the events on our website. And honestly, I think I only have about 60 or 70 to go. So there are hundreds of stories on the RadicalJoy.org website. And if you look under stories, you can see them. And the kinds of places that people pick, uh, what draws them there, what they notice while they're there, what happens. And then, you know, then they make these quirky, crazy birds out of all kinds of stuff. I mean, sometimes they're enormous. They're made out of 
They're made of the boughs of pine trees that have been cut. There's a, there are two friends who go every year to a park in Baltimore. They've been doing it from the very start. They clean up waste in this little park in the city of Baltimore, Maryland. And they make these wonderful little birds um, out, of, out of trash that they pick up. And they're just enchanting. I mean, these birds are absolutely enchanting. And um, I wish I'd thought to bring pictures. I would have shown them to you. But um, but anyway, uh, I, I, it's the, the story and the, the stories and the photos together are um, they're just they're just wonderful because they're about more than just the act of beauty that shows up. It's they're they just bespeak the relationship of people to their place. And I and before I ask you to unmute Shannon, I'm just going to ask, ask one more. Then there's something com that comes up for me about the reciprocity thing. Then so in terms of conversation, it feels like there's a reciprocity there. Do you think there's a kind of a healing benefit the other way? So for the wounded places, I mean, I know that's impossible to to know or say really. But what's your feeling about that? Do you think it's yeah, it, mm. I think it makes a difference, oh, but it's just it's just an intuitive feeling that I have. But here's a story that I really love. So <clears throat> at one of our Global Earth Exchanges, there was a woman in the state of Alabama on the Gulf Coast here in the United States, and uh, she was part of a team that would monitor sea turtles to see how they're doing, because the, sea, the female sea turtles come out of the ocean and they lay their eggs in the sand. And they have a lot of challenges because people ride um, like, you know, all-terrain vehicles on the beach and there are dogs and they disturb the nests. Um, so the, the, this team of people, they go in and they do this. And so they participated in the Global Earth Exchange. And instead of making a bird, they made a turtle out of seaweed. And, um, and she sent me a picture and it's on the website. And then a couple of days later, she wrote me this email and she said, guess what? A mother turtle came and laid her eggs right by our seaweed turtle. And then the next day she said, another turtle came and le left her eggs by the sea turtle. And you have to say, I mean, you, how can you not believe that a certain kind of energy or vibration was shifted by that act from those two women that was felt by the land and, and its beings. I mean, I just don't see there. I know that probably the vast majority of people in our culture would say, oh, it's just a coincidence, but I just don't see how it possibly could be. Yeah, yeah. And if we really are all connected, then there has to be, you know, it feels there has to be, well, yeah. Shannon, would you like to unmute? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna put my gallery view on. Um, yeah, hi, thank you. Um, so you may have slightly answered the question I had just now, but thinking about your, um, your upcoming um, uh, excursion on Saturday to visit this little bird who's endangered, I just, I'm curious about, so instead of a place, it's a being that's in movement, and are you, do you think you'll, and this, so it's kind of similar to the turtles, do you think you'll actually see this bird or will you go to the place where the bird is or, you know, how, or do you just kind of tune into the bird or, or, or what, what's, what's that like? Yeah, thank you. Um, so every now and then people do do them for, for non places, you know, because really animals and birds and fish and insects, they are of their place. You know, like you can't, you could, you wouldn't just go to a, like a museum and do one for a bird that was in a museum. You'd go to the place where the bird is. So, um, so we've had them for not only the turtles, but whales and dolphins and honeybees and um, various other kinds of, you know, living creatures. Uh, where we're going to go to look for the bobolinks is a place that where I have seen them there. Um, so I think we're going to, we, we are likely to see them. I hope that we're going to see them, but we're going to gather and we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the bobolinks uh, and I'm no bird expert by any means. I just looked up stuff on the internet and in a bird magazine. Um, and then we're going to go off and have time alone. People, oh, pe people will share stories about their encounters with bobolinks or what they know about them. Then we'll have time on the land. 
to just see if we see them. And then we'll make some kind of act of beauty, which in this case will probably be an attempt to look like a bobolink rather than <laughs> rather than an anonymous bird. Are you thinking of doing something? Well, uh, I certainly will. I hadn't. <laughs> um, this is a new. Um, this is new to me right now. And uh, yeah, I definitely will consider something. I live in. It's. It's interesting for me. I, I moved to Indiana recently, and to me, there's a lot of wounded places here, and I haven't really established a way of kind of being with that yet. I just. I have been feeling just kind of more grief in places. So now this is like a way of of kind of moving into a different relationship with and I love the I wanted to turn towards it but I didn't quite know how and um so this I think is very helpful and I think I will Good. definitely choose something I kind of like the idea of fireflies actually yeah fireflies that would be a good one yeah yeah we did one for bats once mm -hmm. my husband and I um did 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 one for bats because they had this disease called the white nose uh fungus yeah and we didn't see any bats, but the but the the, the event was for the bats. Beautiful. So good luck, yeah. Thank be, you, thank you very much. I appreciate this. Brilliant, thank you, Shannon. Joy, would you like to unmute? Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I I know Trevi, and I've done uh, I don't know how many years of these, and I just I find that. It's all, it's just all about connection. You know, it's the same, I think, as the night sky has so many stars and it's just so vast. And it's just like a big blur of stars. And then if you learn, if you sit and you look and you learn the constellations, then you have like immediately a relationship. You know, there's Osiris. And it changes the whole sky. And like, I find that the places that I've gone to do the Global Earth Exchange, forever after, I have a relationship with that place where maybe, you know, before it was just part of this road or part of this park or, you know, now it's like, oh, that's where I went. You know, it's very specific. I have a relationship with that. And that just never goes away. And the way what you said, Trevi, about it's like a friend really touched me because I have a friend who recently died from Alzheimer's. And it got increasingly very difficult to talk to her. But I really realized how much she's a fabric she's a thread in the fabric of my life and always will be. And, uh, and it's the same with all these places. Once you go there, <clears throat> you are weaving that place into your life. And there's something that is, you know, really profound about that, at least on a personal level. I always wonder if the place knows also, and I also kind of think it does <laughs> because yeah. we are all one and our minds are here and they're also everywhere and you know yeah there's a woman I know who's who's done them also many years in in Salt Lake City Utah and she 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 wrote that every time she passes this one place that she where she did a, an earth exchange she said I wave hello and it's like <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Joy. If anybody Thank else you, has questions, please put your hands up. Meanwhile, ah, Rena. So I've got my specs on. Rena, would you like to? Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, first, I just want to say this has been really inspirational. I think the book has been on my to read list for a long time and I haven't gotten there. Um, but it makes me also think about. Um, I'm less of a visually artistic person and it makes me think about the places and especially wounded places that I've connected with that are where I live. I'm, I'm in Israel actually. And, um, 
And then I've made story about or written an article or a song or something like that. And that's kind of been my offering. Um, but the idea of bringing other people out into that and into wounded places and not just the relatively intact places in ceremony really intrigues me. And I'd love to hear, like, what are these, you said something about five steps, like, how do you bring people into what I would also call ceremony in a, in a place like this? How do you get them to engage that way? Yeah, yeah, and it is a question that we that we hear a lot. Like, how do how do we persuade people? Um, but it, what I typically do is just say, you know, there's this place, and it's it, or this these this bird species or tree or whatever it is, and um, it, it's in our neighborhood, and uh, it's going through some challenges right now. And let's go and honor it. You know, let's go. I, and I mean, once they're there, what do you do with them to get them to connect? That well, way. first of all, just start by having everybody talk about their relationship with that place or that species. And even if they've never been there before, they can, it, it, all they have to do is just look around, you know, and, and what, what does it feel like to be here? What do you notice? And then after that, everybody goes off and spends 20, 30 minutes alone. And, um, and then they come back and share stories. It's really, really, really simple. And then after that, you make your your bird or whatever it is, you know, um, or you sing. I mean, if, if you you don't, it doesn't have to be a visual representation. You could sing. You could you could say a prayer, you know, whatever. It's just really simple, and it's not it's not like a big deal ritual. We have to where we all have to do a certain thing, and we all have to be in unison, and we all have to stand and kneel and all that stuff. It's just sharing stories have a look around, tell another story about what you discovered, and then make beauty. You know, it's, it's just, it's simple. Kids do it. I mean, th we have had so many children participate in this. Wonderful. Thanks, Rena. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'd love to talk about kind of the future then beauty as a force to kind of get us through what some, you know, what, you know, the, the kind of continuing ecological difficulties, you know, how, how do you see that helping, you know? I see it as more important than ever. And in fact, I've, um, I woke up in the middle of the night last summer and I just said, earth hospice. I just said, that's what needs to happen. And so I started writing a book called earth hospice and I do a, um, I, I co-facilitate with, uh, my colleague Allison Cornish, um, uh, every other Wednesday, yes, yesterday was the Wednesday, every other Wednesday, we do a 20 minute online program called Earth Hospice Rights. Um, the idea being that if you if you really have intention, you can focus in deeply and meaningfully in a short amount of time. And we always have 20 minutes in a day. And um, and I, I've, I've also just I've, I've been doing some programs and some talks on on earth hospice this summer because i think that if we if we want to go through the ramifications of climate change without losing our minds and still finding meaning and beauty and joy in life and connection with ourselves our family our children our grandchildren our neighbors um that it's really incumbent upon us to be aware of the beauty that remains um, as much as possible, even as we are aware of what's what we're losing, and that and that there has to be that really really fine balance where sometimes we're going to tip into immense grief, and sometimes we're going to say, oh yeah, but look at all this beauty. I don't have to deal with that grief. It's going to be a balance. It's going to be a scale like that. And by acknowledging one at any particular time, it doesn't mean the other one is invalid. It just means that one is higher in our consciousness right now. But if we keep them both in balance, um, then we can be with the earth as it goes through these changes. And we can be with one another and we can be honest about our grief and not try to hide it. Because I, as, as we know, if we try and hide deep feelings, they just come out in all kinds of other ways. 
like reckless driving or picking on your friends or your family or being judgmental or you know hurting yourself and there's just it, it's it's just so much healthier to be in relationship with the deep feelings even the painful ones so what does earth hospice involve then kind of is there a process that you're talking to or, do, or just, is it just awareness that it needs to no i'm actually creating a bunch of practices for it and um and and you know, i think that what we do with the radical joy for hard times practice is um it's 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 certainly relevant you know all but practices that you can do with children it's it's about you know how we talk to one another about it and what kinds of conversations we have it's really in a formative stage right now but but again i think that anything to be meaningful and to catch on it has to be simple it has to be so simple that and that's what i that's what i always say about radical joy for hard times and what i is i'm also saying about earth hospice it doesn't cost any money you don't have to mobilize people you don't have to organize anything you don't have to go and read 100 books you don't have to find a wise tutor you know you can just do it at any time we all know how to do these things and we're all kind of wanting to do something anyway, but just not really, you know, even knowing whether that's a valid feeling, you know, a lot of the time, it, it just feels like, yeah, it, it's such a needed thing, really. Mm -hmm. You talk about radical joy, and the other word, obviously, because your new book's titled with it, Theist Consciousness, can you just say a little bit about that? Yeah, I started working on that. I started to write about what I'm now writing about, although I wasn't thinking about Earth hospice, about how we're going to deal with climate change. And then the uh, coronavirus pandemic happened. And then my husband died uh, almost three years ago of cancer. And, um, and I realized that what I was writing about how all th these di different they're different attitudes and perceptions. How do we change our perception in really simple ways that, that, that it fit for all kinds of grief, climate grief, social grief, personal grief. And so Fierce Consciousness is a book of 35 very short chapters, and they have kind of quirky titles like Claim Your Superpower, uh, Get Dirty, uh, Balance the Feathers of Grief and Joy, uh, refuse to dis disbelieve punch through the avalanche so they're they're yeah there's joy has the book right there they're quirky they're quirky titles but they're all the chapters are really about um what the what the titles imply and uh, and they're all simple and you can read the book straight way through or you can just open it up and see what pops out at random and and uh and and it's i i, I mean i i personally truly believe that if we have our eyes out for beauty, we can survive anything. And in the beginning of the book, I tell a story about right after my husband died, like 45 minutes after he died um, in a hospice. And I, I called his three grown children. I called a couple of my friends. And then I walked outside. It was a hot summer night in August. And there were these insects, these katydids singing in the trees all around the in the woods. And it was so beautiful. It was this, it, it was this life force that could not, the, the, the Katie Dids had something to do. They had a song to sing. They had a message to broadcast. And it didn't matter if it was the worst hour of my entire life where I just lost this person who I deeply, deeply loved. And, um, but the Katie Dids were singing and I was so stunned. I actually put my bags down on the sidewalk and listened for a minute. And then I put my hands together and I bowed to them. And I said, thank you. Because it was just, it was life pushing through grief at, at that dark time. And I'll never, ever, ever forget those Katie dids. Wow. Keeping an eye out for beauty. I've got a quote then from you. I know that no matter what's going on in life, astonishing acts of beauty, compassion, and even joy are waiting to be given and received. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lifesavers. Yeah. Jennifer. Sorry, hi. I, I wanted to thank Trevi so much. I found this really inspirational and, and quite moving, actually, because there's an awful lot of building going on in the in 
definitely in England at the moment, I think, as a whole, but in and a lot of places are very wounded and becoming very devastated, which is quite heartbreaking. But I've always shied away from revisiting those places because they no longer hold the beauty they did. And there was a place opposite where I work, which had a building on it before, but had a really beautiful, beautiful ash tree. It wasn't suffering from any dieback or anything, it was beautiful. And it was chopped down to make way for a new building, even though a lot of local people had fought hard to try and keep it there. And the day it was chopped down, I ran out and asked for, from work and said to the people chopping down, please, can I have a piece of the tree? And they gave me a big piece of the trunk at the bottom. I had to carry it back to my office. Oh. And I and, and we we took it out and we said, said words for it and thanked it. And it's here as a, we, we kept it in its raw state but it sits here with a candle on it. And we did the same for a tree at the back of us that was cut down. We went and got a piece and bought it and kept it in its real state. It's in the garden and it, and it sort of provides a shelter for little animals. And But I've shied away. I've always disliked looking at the place where the ash tree was and the place where the tree stood at the back of me. So I feel quite inspired now to actually look at those the place where it was, the space where it was, and perhaps do something there as well. Um, uh, you know, so I found your, your talk really, really inspiring. And, and yeah, I feel quite moved to want to go back to those spaces and actually look at them rather oh, than that's go away. Thank you. And I just, I just think it's wonderful. I mean, I can just picture you running out there and carrying this big piece of tree back to you. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was that's really lovely. I mean, it's great that you did that. Thank you. And it's, I was mad. They asked what I wanted it for. And I sort of said, uh, just humor me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. and they were just kind enough to hand it over the fencing. And then you sort of handed it over and said, here you go. But yeah. Well, good luck visiting your place. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Anybody else? Okay, Chebby, so we're nearly at our end. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to mention that we haven't talked about? Well, I just would love, if, um, if you'd like to go and if you'd like to participate in the Global Earth Exchange this Saturday or a day close to it, it doesn't have to be exactly Saturday, well, that's when most people do it. Um, please do. And uh, if you go to the website, radicaljoy.org, there's right at the very top of the homepage, there are um, way, there's in more information you can get about it. You can read stories, and there's a form that you can fill out with a with a description of what happened in your photo. And then you you just it's very easy to fill out, and it just automatically goes to the website and gets approved, and then it goes up. So um, so I would love to encourage you to participate, and um, we wouldn't get a flag by the time you. Uh, by the time you uh, do it, and I, I, but you know, if, if you wanted to email me at Treby Johnson at radicaljoy.org, I could send it to you later. Do you think it's more powerful in groups, or I guess it depends on the places and depends on the intention? Yeah, I don't think it matters. You know, I don't think it matters because it's really about the place. You know, that's what. That's what I, I I truly believe. If you if you thought maybe you got ten friends to come and then only one person shows up, it's okay because you're doing it for the place and the place isn't counting. The place isn't saying, "Whoa, this is disappointing." I thought there would be more people here to honor me. You know, that's <laughs> just just it doesn't happen. Wow. Well, it's been fantastic to have you at last. Um, I hope that with beauty, why well, may beauty increase, you know, I, I think that we are kind of on the trajectory of our imagination of thinking that it's going down, but, you know, it could also increase. And I really hope that, well, you, it, it seems to me that you are one of the people that are kind of waving the flag for that. And um, it's really inspirational for so many people have said to hear that. So, Thank you so much, Chevy. Thank you, Rachel. And here's another thing. If we're looking for beauty, it's more likely to occur than if we're not. If we have our eyes open, our ears open, our senses open, we're going to see it. If we don't, 
it, it'll be might be a huge impact every now and then. But if we have our our sensibilities open, we'll see it multiple times a day. And I suppose it's that trying not to close down. I think Jennifer, as you said, try not to close down just because you see wounding. It's just trying to keep that kind of sensibility open to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Rachel, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Come again, Trevi. Thank we'll you all. Keep, keep in touch. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you all so right. much. This is wonderful. Bye. 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 That was great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. It was delightful. Lovely. We'll see you. I'll email you tomorrow and let's do it again sometime. Oh, yes, no. let's do. Next time it'll be our turn. Yeah, it will come come in person next time. Oh, I'll yeah. All right. Of course, if you're ever in the UK visiting Devon, you know, come and we'll do something. OK, yeah, Devon's beautiful. <laughs> Because Schumacher College was also in Devon and you didn't make it that time. So That's right, I didn't make it. Yeah, so so it's time. I think it's time for you to I think it's time. Yeah, well we can sort we can host it, sort it out, whatever. So all right. All right, Rachel. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Lots of love. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.